Hello there. My name is Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Elsewhere in the audio archive, I've produced podcasts looking at various aspects of fishing in and around the North West. Some are current, while others record some of the better known historical aspects of sea angling, particularly along the Lancashire coast. With that in mind, what I definitely don't want to do here is revisit subject material that has already been dealt with elsewhere. The file jumbo cod fishing, for example, which I have detailed myself, and the history of how Fleetwood and Morecambe Bay came to be opened up for serious charter fishing, as witnessed through the eyes of veteran ex-charter skipper Frank B. What I would like to do here is combine current as well as historical information regarding the situation along the North Lancashire coast. That said, it may not turn out to be the Lancashire coast as you know it, or should I say, think you know it, because it stretches all the way northwards to the Dudden estuary, fringing the northern tip of Walney Island, the real Lancashire coast, not the carved-off remnant resulting from the local government reorganisation of 1974, which contrary to popular thinking, did not and does not geographically place Barrow in Furness in Cumbria, nor Liverpool on Merseyside. For administrative purposes, perhaps, but in terms of actual county boundaries, these remain as they were prior to 1974, with Barrow in Furness, along with the nearby lakes of Windermere and Coniston, still a part of Lancashire. The lakes are something I shall come back to in another podcast, looking at post-glacial relic fish populations, such as ferox, trout and char, which both Windermere and Coniston contain. But for now, I'll stick with the sea fishing, or to be more precise, the offshore boat fishing, and in particular, small boat fishing, for which our county has a long, rich and very enviable tradition. I've small boat fished for many years, starting by venturing off quite long distances in small rowing boats around Anglesey, the thought of which now makes me shudder when I look at the boats and safety equipment we had in 2010. But we did it, and thankfully, we got away with it, probably because we didn't know any better. Then, back in 1970, I was persuaded to join a small local boat fishing club, which organised trips all over the northern part of the UK. Unfortunately, on my very first trip with them to Morecambe, which still had lots of good fish back then, when we left the big boat at the moorings to row the last leg back to the shore, the rowing boat we were in was swamped, and we all ended up in the water. Thankfully, everyone managed to scramble back safely by holding on to each other, but for me as a complete non-swimmer, I was unable to bring myself to set foot in a small boat again for at least a couple of years, until I heard about the fabulous fishing up in Scotland with a chap called Davy Agnew at Loch Ryan. So reluctantly, I agreed to go, and eventually became a Loch Ryan regular, taking a couple of Scottish and one British record up there under Davy's guidance. But I have to say, I really did not enjoy those early trips, and could hardly take my eyes off the 16-foot boat's transom, half expecting the following wave to come swamping in again, until eventually I regained some confidence, which is perhaps as well in light of what was to come, and my lifelong association with small boats. It was around this time that I got to know Keith Philbin, who would later go on to build and skipper the very successful Fleetwood charter boat Happy Hooker. But when I first met him, he'd just taken delivery of a trailer full of fiberglass matting, gel coat and resin, and was about to start work on building a fishing dinghy in his garage, a subject that has already been covered in my podcast on file jumbo cod. My reason for mentioning it again here is that it spurred me on to eventually buy my own boat, a 16-foot Mackay Viking, the same as Davy Agnew had used up at Loch Ryan, only instead of twin seagulls, Steve Lill and I decided on a 9.9 Johnson outboard instead. Around that same period, I also got to know a chap called Mick Murs, who with his dad George, and a couple of friends, fished the file in the winter months and the Walney area during the summer, from a 16-foot pebble, which for those that don't know, is a very seaworthy trail version of an East Coast cobble. Though there was some dinghy fishing taking place out from Barrow at the time, much of that was centred around the Walney Channel, with most boats going afloat in front of the ferry, adjacent to the Walney Bridge. 
I'm told it was also possible to sail north to the Dublin from there on a very big tide at high water, though just how you might get back is another matter. Everyone, so far as I know, who launched the ferry headed south down the channel, which due to the distances involved, and bearing in mind that most people back then used plodding displacement boats, pretty much confined the fishing to around Falmy, Upper Morecambe Bay, and the seaward side of the bottom end of Walney. Mick, Steve Lill and I, on the other hand, as soon as we crossed the Walney Bridge, would take a left turn down to a little water's edge car park at Bigger Bank, where we would sometimes camp for the odd weekend between Spring Bank holiday and early September. Sometimes we'd even strip the boats out there too, remove their engines and handball them across the bouldery upper shore to fish the heavy ground lying a couple of miles off. But mainly, we'd just park there and walk down the beach at low tide to dig blow lug with the forks, not stopping until we had at least 300 worms per boat, which we'd wash off, then separate the living ones from any that were damaged. The good ones would then be put a handful at a time onto two or three sheets of newspaper and lay it up loosely in a bucket, with the damaged worms on newspaper at the top. The reason for this was to harden the live worms up, and to prevent any damaged worms sending the rest of them off if the day turned out to be a warm one. There was also another practical reason for this. We dug this bait to fish for place, and experience had shown that even when there were plenty of them about, when you were fishing at anchor, as we always did, you need to slowly build up their interest levels. What appears to happen was that as the first few places in the immediate vicinity started tugging and rattling the baits, this would attract the attention of others just a little bit further off, which when they became interested, would draw in yet more fish from even further afield. Anyway, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here. So we would dig the bait, head up the coast to Ernsey Bay next to the little holiday camp close to the airstrip, and put the boats in from the clean sandy beach there. I have been back to Ernsey Bay recently to see what the current situation is, because with the subsequent advent of bigger, faster planing boats, we began sailing the 22 miles across Morecambe Bay from the file coast instead of driving around, and as a result, lost touch. The slip is still there, though looking a bit worse for wear. The beach itself also looks the same, with quite a lengthy finger of rocks pointing seaward. Whether the fishing is still up to much now is another matter, but it most certainly was back then in the mid-1970s. We only ever launched with cars back then, which with two-wheel drive meant we were consistently in risk of losing one on the beach, though thankfully we never actually did. Funnily enough, the only problem we ever had was just before we stopped driving around. We'd bought an old Series 3 Land Rover by that stage, and had forgotten to put the freewheeling hubs into four-wheel drive, causing it to dig in, and for us to have to dig it out with shovels, which along with various snatching ropes, we always carried in the back of the van. What we'd do back then with the cars, was drive carefully onto the beach in second gear, with the boat ready to be slipped from the trailer. And for as far as we could, we'd then follow the line of the rocks. But eventually, we did have to cross some open beach so it had to be a quick, slick job of trying to get the boat in and off without ever stopping the car wheels slowly turning. If on the odd occasion we did have to stop, we had wooden boards ready to slip under the towing vehicle's wheels, and touch wood, both literally as well as metaphorically, we never had a problem. But things may not be the same on Ernsey Beach these days. Ernsey Bay to the north of the slip on into the Dudden Estuary is very shallow, comprising a series of constantly shifting sandbanks and gullies. This was why we could get away with the digging down a bigger bank for a couple of hours and still have enough time to fish. That would see us putting the anchor down at around half flood, with usually, though not always, enough bay to see us through to high water. Get there any earlier and you risk running aground, or being restricted to where you could fish. Remember, there was no GPS back then, the Navstar even was still some years away, so we probably never fished in exactly the same spot twice, and with little in the way of landmarks to line up with on the inside of the dunes, repeat visits were probably never even close. But it never seemed to matter. Always we get off to a steady start, with building momentum all the way up to high water and the bait running out. 
A couple of useful short anecdotes spring to mind here. The first involved my son Ian, who at the time was only about six years old and very independent. You could tell him or even show him what to do, but he then always had to do it for himself. Uptiding wasn't something we really bothered with much at that time, which in any case was still very much in its infancy. We just used to lob our three hook wire paternosters a short distance over the back of the board. The fish didn't really seem that bothered. As I said earlier, just as long as you kept hitting the same spot, that was usually good enough. Now Ian at that time wasn't very much of a caster, so he would very often just lower his baits down directly under the boat. Even so, the size and numbers of some of the plays he caught would, certainly by today's standards, be breathtaking. The other incident was the evening when Liverpool won the European Cup, helped by Kenny Dalglish slotting one in from an almost impossible angle. Steve had dragged the boat up to Walney, and I was up there for the week with the family in a touring caravan based at Bigger Bank. After leaving the boat with me for the week, he would then, weather permitting, come up on a day-by-day -day basis, and on one of those days he brought along with him Keith Philbin. Unfortunately for Keith, it was a lumpy, breezy day, and it looked as though we were never going to get out. Then, towards late afternoon, it started to settle. The only problem was that I wanted to watch the match. Anyway, we decided to give it a couple of hours, but to be honest, it was still on the margin of being fit. So we just mortared off a short distance, or to put it another way, as far as we dared, put the anchor down and gave it a talk and go. And what a fantastic session that turned out to be, as good in many ways as the far more favoured areas, suggesting, as did the little story of Ian always fishing under the boat, that the area was quite literally carpeted with the things, which if the truth be known, it probably was. Our best catch for three hours, over four rods, was 530 fish, a good 60% of which were place. And not just small place either, though in fairness there were plenty of throwbacks in there too. But always in amongst them would be a very generous sprinkling of two to three pounders, plus the odd better fish as well. The biggest place I personally caught there was four pounds one ounce, and the best I ever saw came in at five pound five. And if a two to three pound place doesn't sound big, then clearly you've never actually had one up at the side of a small boat. Because when a fish of that size, covered in big red spots, hits the surface, if your heart doesn't start thumping, then really you shouldn't be there. And you always instinctively knew when you had a place on the line, because unlike dabs which give up the moment you strike, and flounders which are only marginally better, plays fight all the way to the net, with repeated powerful dives, and they almost always hit the surface colour side up. Sometimes on the way back up the beach after worm digging, and particularly when we were camping, we would root out a few peeler crabs and softies from between the rocks. We would from time to time also pick up small bass, and very occasionally a better bass on the small worm baits, but fishing with crab almost assured them back then. I remember having the family out one afternoon, when no sooner had we launched than the sky started to darken and a powerful squally wind got up too. I remember also that the radio aerial ominously started buzzing. Shortly after that, the thunder and lightning started. So we sat huddled under the cuddy with the aerial down and the radio switched off, waiting until it had passed. As soon as it did, the crab baits were out and for as long as they lasted, it was virtually a bass a throw, with the best one falling just short of nine pounds. On some occasions, particularly when we were up there for a few days, having put the boat in at Ernsey Bay, usually with not another soul in sight, we'd turn left down past the Coast Guard lookout, instead of heading right for the Dudden Estuary. If you stopped off in front of a lookout and fished with mackerel, there were always plenty of taupe, but that was really our objective. Our aim was to carry on heading southwards and seaward to fish the deeper lying reefy ground off Bigger Bank. Crab was always a very good bait out there, but if you couldn't get hold of it, then perks were almost as good. Tackle losses out there, unfortunately, were often quite high, but the quality of the summer cod, some of which would be well up into double figures, and on occasions even over £20, more than justified the cost. 
Another way of regularly losing tackle out there, both on crab and with the perks, was to tope. So bad was it at times that the perks and baits had to be fished on wire, which ties in very nicely with a much more recent experience fishing a little further down the island, still over the heavy ground, with Andy Bradbury, aboard his charter boat Blue Mink out from Fleetwood. This was in July of 2008, and while the summer cod fishing was by that stage a mere shadow of its former self, the lads on board still wanted to head over to Walney in the hope of a nice species mix, including the possibility even of the odd black bream, which over recent years have started putting in more of a regular appearance along the Lancashire coast. But from the very first drop it became immediately obvious that that simply wasn't going to happen. Everything we put down was snaffled up by Taupe, followed shortly afterwards by the inevitable bite-off. No one had come geared up for catching Taupe that day, but eventually some wire was found, and a bunch of taupe traces was cobbled together. And what a good day's taupe fishing it turned into, anchored up just in front of the beacon on what we used to call Mulgrew's Farm. Recent conversations with Andy Bradbury suggest that that situation still remains very much the case. Huge numbers of taupe are still about, not only over the rough ground from the middle of the island down to the bottom, but right across Morecambe Bay to Loon Deep and beyond. If only the same could still be said for that other highly rated predator, the bass. Morecambe Bay, Walney Island, and the other smaller islands just to the south of Barrow and Furness have always played host to quite a reasonable head of bass. But following some excellent recruitment years during the 1990s, cited by some as evidence for global warming, by the turn of the century we had an absolute bass boom on our hands, which inevitably as you might expect from such a popular and commercially viable species, was, unfortunately, rather short-lived. So abundant were these fish that I became involved in a couple of science-based projects to better understand the bass population, both locally as well as nationally, and to help promote some measure of restraint and conservation, which on the basis of current pitifully low numbers in the area, show for the most part fell on deaf ears. The first stage of that involvement was a drive round to Barrow to meet up with Walney locals Kenny Bowes and Mike Turner for a run out in Kenny's boat from the southern end of the channel with a view to tagging some bass as part of a national project aimed at better understanding where these fish overwinter and to plot their redistribution northwards once the colder weather was gone. On board, Kenny had a small fine mesh otter trawl which he set out towards the bottom end of the channel and which very quickly brought up so many sand eels that we literally couldn't cope. The live wells were bursting at the seams, which we hoped would be a good omen as we headed out into Upper Morecambe Bay. For the first hour or so, it seemed that nothing was going to come our way. The first mark produced not a single touch, while at the second, every cast resulted in a bite-off by toe, and the weather unfortunately was also starting to deteriorate by that stage. So we motored the boat back to one of the closer in marks in case we had to make a sudden dash for cover. And bingo! In less than three hours, we put tags into 42 bass, none of which, to my knowledge, unfortunately, has ever been recovered. The second part of my data gathering involvement gave more of an immediate result. One of the pioneers responsible for uncovering the bonanza around the Loon Deep was a friend of mine from the Fowl Boat Angling Club named Dave Woods. Concerned about the unsustainable numbers of bass being regularly taken from around Shell Wharf and Heesham Number 2 Boy, Dave was keen at least to get some sort of meaningful information from these fish and if possible try to limit their overcropping by members of the File Boat Angling Club. With Dave, I attended the 2003 AGM of the club, which against all expectation voted in proposals not only to limit the number of bass any FBA sea boat could bring ashore in a day to three, but also up the takeable size limit from the national minimum of 36 centimetres to 45 centimetres. Not only this, but all members were urged to weigh and measure their fish and remove a couple of scales in an attempt not only to get a better understanding of the year class structure leading up to the boom, but also to help construct a viable weight estimation chart to minimise the stress suffered by those fish which were later to be returned. As a fishery scientist with access to all the necessary scale reading equipment, 
I was given the job of collecting and evaluating the incoming data, and over that summer we received 112 separate data sets. Unfortunately, no double figure fish data ever came our way, though it was hoped by the use of regression analysis that we could reasonably extrapolate the graph to successfully cover that end of the scale. We also had problems down at the other end of the size range, for although anglers were catching undersized fish at times, they were returning them without bothering to collect the data. So again, regression analysis would have to come to the rescue. One of the objectives, which was to see if there was any sort of relationship between size and age, not unexpectedly showed very wide fluctuations to the point where size in this particular context really didn't matter. We recorded fish from the abundant 1989 year class at as little as four and a half pounds and as much as nine and a quarter pounds. Equally, we recorded fish of approximately five and a half pounds at 12, 13, 14, 15 and 16 years of age, while we also had one 11 year old fish, which was a year younger than those five and a half pounders, tip the scales eight and three quarter pounds. So clearly, there was absolutely no correlation. But not surprisingly, there was a very strong correlation between length and weight, including the extrapolated extremities for which there was little or no data present. The resulting graph had a reliability percentage of 91.2%, which for a wild population, in scientific terms at least, is about as good as it gets. Anyone interested in seeing this graph, plus the rest of the data, should navigate to the main body of the website to the Articles Archive Fishery Science folder, which contains an inclusion called Bass Growth Project. The date for this recording is 2010, and I have to say that bass numbers are now a mere shadow of what they were, particularly at the turn of the century. As I've already said, some people cite the good recruitment years as a sign of global warming, but in all honesty, Temperature alone cannot be responsible. For while it does help promote distribution through northerly migration, spawning success is equally dependent upon other factors including weather-related sea conditions, which also counters the suggestion that Hesham's two nuclear power stations are also responsible. The fact that warm water released from the two outfalls attracts huge numbers of immature bass and will most certainly help promote more rapid growth thereby benefiting the local fishery, has little to do with fry numbers available for recruitment. And in line with the national trend, bass numbers along the Lancashire coast are no longer at the levels they were just a few years ago. Speaking of Hesham Power Station, ex-commercial longliner and Fleetwood charter skipper Frank B., who opened up the potential of Morecambe as the thornback fishery of national acclaim, put the eventual demise of the rays down to the warm water coming from Hesham, which has reputedly given the bay an average temperature increase of around one degree. For more on that particular topic, tune in to Frank B's podcast elsewhere on the site. Other sources, including Scottish Sea Angling Conservation Network Projects Director Ian Burrett, who also has a podcast on the site, sees a decline in ray numbers generally as indicative of commercial pressure, which SSACN are fighting to reverse, and with some success through legislation coming from the European Court. I say this because currently there is some evidence that the thornbacks are starting to make a slow but very positive return to the Lancashire coast, though not necessarily with the same distribution they enjoyed when they were here in numbers last time around. Back in the 1970s, Morecambe Bay and the Fleetwood Charter Fleet had a thornback ray fishery that was so good that anglers would travel huge distances just to grab a piece of the action. The best of the fishing, which could start as early as March and go on in some years to Christmas week when I've taken them in the past, was invariably on the smaller tides or around the slacker periods on the middle range tides, because at any other time the run is so great in Morecambe Bay that it becomes virtually unfishable. Part of the problem was also the fact that most people used to take the rays home to eat, and although I personally hate eating the things, because to me it's like trying to chew a urine-contaminated corset, I must confess that on one particular occasion I was also guilty of this offence. The thing is, 
that you can't continually crop any slow reproducing fish population and expect numbers year on year to remain the same. The incident of my involvement was a day of a lifeboat competition in which the whole Fleetwood charter boat fleet was involved. Unfortunately, I can't remember the actual year, but with so many boats participating, plus the fact that I was aboard Happy Hooker, skippered by my dinghy fishing compadre Keith Philbin, it must have been somewhere around 1980. Initially, we'd headed off to one spot just north of Loon looking to get some place, but unfortunately, things had not gone too well. So with quite a sizable chunk of the allocated time already gone, we moved up onto the rough edge of the bay between Loon Boy and Lightning Knoll, looking for thornbacks, and from what followed, presumably we found them pretty much straight away. It turned out to be absolute carnage, and they all had to be kept for weighing in purposes because it was a competition. Competition rules probably also came to the fish's rescue too, as we were still dragging them aboard all around the boat when we had to leave to make it back in time. The port record of that time for numbers of thornback rays taken in a single trip was 45. We upped that to 97, and could, very easily, have taken it well beyond the 100 mark. Interestingly, two other boats broke the old record that day too, a figure I can't see ever being bettered. Certainly not in my lifetime, because as Andy Bradbury told me recently, he now only picks up the odd one here and there. Over the past few seasons, we've started seeing a few along the file picking up our tote baits, particularly in front of an Aubrey castle. That said, from late summer through to Christmas, the River Mersey is now ram jam full of the things, though that's another story. One fish never mentioned these days in conversations regarding the North Lancashire coast is the turbot. Yet they were occasionally taken on rod and line from the Upper Morecambe Bay area when fishing for rays, particularly around Lightning Knoll. I have to say, though, that I haven't heard a single mention of the things in years. That said, I had a very interesting experience back in 1986 while out on the Fleetwood trawler Biddy, skippered by Frank B.'s brother Ben who sadly drowned when his replacement boat sank out in the bay when it's believed he got his neck caught up on some sort of fastener. I could so easily have been on board that day too, as I used to go out there with him on a regular basis collecting diseased and reverse flatfish for research purposes, particularly from the edge of Loon. On one particular day, he decided to do the last drag across the bay towards South Walney. The thing is that when you do a four-hour drag, there is no way of knowing just exactly where on that line any particular fish entered the net. What I can say was that when he hauled the net, amongst other things including a couple of nice turbot, there was also more than a dozen big brill, the best of which was well into double figures. So with little or no trawling in the area these days, there is no reason to suspect that there are not more turbot and brill about. The question is, exactly where? So far, my slant on the historical side of things along the North Lancashire coast has unfortunately included quite a bit of doom and gloom. So I'd like to wind things up on a positive note by looking at some of what is currently on offer, and to start with, a positive success story. One of the big success stories of recent times, both nationally as well as locally, has been the expansion in both numbers and distributional range of the smoothhounds. I use the term here as a plural, because at the moment two species are still shown in the British record list, despite the fact that DNA-based research by Dublin scientist Ed Farrell has shown the presence and absence of white spots to be little more than a within-species variation. Anyway, whatever the final outcome of that particular story, smoothhounds have been progressively expanding their range northwards, to the point where the Ian Burrup podcast recorded at Ardwell inside Loose Bay in Scotland was actually done on a smoothhound trip. So all suitable areas, including the Lancashire coast, should now haul the things. But it hasn't always been that way. Prior to the 1980s, I don't remember ever seeing or hearing about smoothhounds anywhere along the Lancashire coast. Mind you, with no one expecting them, and few people up here aware of the main identificational features, they could have been here all the time, and simply passed off as small taupe. One thing's for sure, they are most certainly here now, 
but they do tend to be rather localised, which in light of the vast increase in numbers, suggests to me at least, that there needs to be something specific down there in the way of food to hold their interest. The ground, all the way from Russell Point to just beyond the Norbrecht Castle Hotel, is very heavy, but south of that, to a point, it does start to clean up. So maybe in front of the Norbrecht it's more mixed, because that's where you tend to find the bulk of the smooth hounds both from the boats and from the shore, along with Bullhuss and Thornback Race. For years, they've tended to weigh between four and seven pounds, with only the occasional better fish. Then, back in 2008, we suddenly started getting lots of very small hounds on worm baits fish close in for place, suggesting an expansion in numbers. At the other end of the scale, I also had a nice one of around 15 pounds in 2010, and in 2008, a chap fishing with Andy Bradbury aboard Blue Mink lost a huge top size smoothie at the net when the fish dragged his light monofilament line across somebody else's braid, causing it to part. But the story doesn't end there, because for some reason in the progression northwards, they somehow seem to bypass certain areas, which have since been shown to be ideal for them. I was invited down to Rill in 2005 by Tony Parry to sample a sudden appearance of smooth hounds there and it wasn't long afterwards that they started showing around the outer edge of the Mersey, still in Lancashire, both areas having previously been bypassed by the species on the way north to the Fylde. So I personally wouldn't be too surprised to hear them starting to show up in suitable areas of Morecambe Bay and around Walney Island, if indeed they're not already there. Bringing this podcast right up to date, for various reasons, including the weather, from a dinghy angling perspective at least, It has not been the best of times lately along the North Lancashire coast. Milder temperatures have brought with them prolonged bouts of the prevailing west to south-westerly wind over extended periods, which obviously has a knock-on effect to the fishing. This isn't the same, however, as saying that the fish haven't been about, because when you can't get out on a regular basis, it's difficult to accurately assess specific current trends. Certainly the place appear to have been making a welcome comeback at a number of locations, which makes me wonder if the Dudnery could also be added to that list. Good numbers have also been coming in very close to the shore along the strip from Little Bispam, where the Fileboat Angling Club launch, to the Royal Hotel, where the Wireboat Club puts in. Andy Bradbury is also reporting good place catches around his usual haunts from the Wire Channel out into Morecambe Bay. Top numbers are also good off the file itself, around the northern edge of Loon, and over off the southern tip of Walney, where one of Andy's parties on Blue Mink recently had 48 top to 46 pounds, and on another trip, a complete novice angler had one over 70 pounds. Two other interesting trends have been good numbers of pollock along the file, and plenty of takeable sized summer cod. This hopefully bodes well for the autumn and winter fishing, which has not been that good for the past couple of seasons. So a mixture then of nostalgia, optimism, and as always, pessimism, all of which can be stalked up to varying degrees by a look at some of the inclusions in the North West record list. Place, £5.11. ounces, Turbot, £13.5 from Blackpool's North Pier, and £15.25 ounces from the boat. Cod, £42 from the boat, and £40.5 from Whitehaven Pier. A bass of £13.6 ounces from the shore. The British record tub gurnard at almost £11.5. A thornback ray of £31.5, and even a stingray of £27. Which, having found the North West Coast favourable once, could, with a little help from the conservation lobby, if we are lucky, find it as appealing again in the future. Thank you.